So you might need something lower level and have like uh, and it's more lightweight compared to JavaScript. Let's say C something else. Okay, history of FastMD. How how does it, how they came about FastMD? First, there is a NSCI, NSCI Google Native Client. I know about that. <laughs> and as a, as as a not yes, it's quite popular for some time. They released a JavaScript where they, the JavaScript can make use of the binary file, and then it can run some game on that, on top of that. But then ASM.js is not the standard. And right now, a few organizations come about and then they build something called WebSMD. And it's, a, it's currently a working graph. The, the, the Bukri said standard working graph, but it's not the standard yet. But still, now most of the browser, major browser, can use WebSMD. The main major browser that you use. Okay, so about WebSMD and why is it fast? So first, let's see about JavaScript. How JavaScript start to commerce society in the past. So first, JavaScript, you need some time to pass. After that, last time, it used to take a long time to execute, just line by line. And then after that, they do garbage collection after, after, the, after it ends. So now, JavaScript is a lot faster, they optimize it a lot. So it became something like this, where they still need to pass after downloading and then they need to compile and they need to optimize it. When during while running, they still need to re-optimize it again and later they just execute it. But how WebAssembly is faster? WebAssembly is in binary form, it's more compact. So it is compiled on the compiled on the server side. So before you publish the publish the source code, no, publish the client side. Something like uh, what they call the WebSMD. So it's more compact and then uh, it's built on built during the server time. So it's something like this. So it, from the top one is the JavaScript. It became just the code compiled. Of, Compile and optimize, and then execute. It's already packed in a form where uh, it's like in the intermediate rep representation format. It have a specific format, and then the file later I'll show how how does it look like. And so because of the small format, it makes it a lot faster. And of course, the assembly is not aimed to replace JavaScript. But right now, WebAssembly, you cannot use WebAssembly standalone. You cannot just put HTML instead of script. You cannot put like put WebAssembly as the module and then run it. You still need to rely on one JavaScript file to call the WebAssembly, to import the WebAssembly and call it. So first, why, why is WebAssembly good? So because it fetches a lot as well. It's compiled on the and optimize on the server side and it also decode a lot faster than JavaScript. JavaScript is, sometimes you don't even minimize it but before sending but web assembly is already done during server side and it's compiled ahead of time in the LVM. Depends uh, but uh, most of them they use LVM such as C, those they use LVM. Web assembly doesn't have garbage collection but I think Go implementation does put some garbage collection there. But for C, for others, they don't have garbage collection, so that's why it's faster and more efficient. And why is it bad? Right now, they still have a lot of issues with WebSMD. One is it that it requires JavaScript to run. Without JavaScript, you cannot make it run. And there's no string support. But people have ways to mitigate this using the integers and then they map it, some, something like that. And of course, there's some foreign, foreign function interface cost there when you, call, when you call the function too many times. And those post MVP, right, is what they plan to do the minimum wearable product they plan, they plan to do in the future. Where I think some of them they are already doing now, where the plan something doesn't have direct DOM modification, you cannot modify the object, the document there in the HTML, you cannot modify the ID, and there's no shared memory concurrency in WebSMD. So there's no SIFD support. SMD is a uh, 
single instruction, multiple multiple what? Zero. But there's one one CPU support thing there. I don't remember why is it called. It's something single instruction multiple directive. I think is it called multiple data. Multiple data. So you have uh, just one instruction. You can call like let's say you have a vector. You want to multiply the vector, multiply multiple vector, and some CPU they have uh, specific support for this. So you can make use of they make use of that, and uh, it'll be just it'll be a lot faster. And of course, NetWebAssembly also has no exception handling for now on JavaScript side. And how to use WebAssembly? Right now, as of I know, so what I know, C and C plus plus, you need to use the ends written. I think it's built by binary yen. Uh. And for Rust, later I'll talk about Rust here. So Rust, you just need to set it, set the target to the triple wasm32 unknown, unknown. And then wasm pack is the one one of the command line application to make use of uh Wasm and JavaScript modules in npm, so you can pull report, pull stuff from npm, and then you can also send web as a big stuff. You can build the library, and then you can also publish it to npm as well. And go okay, thanks to Wei Jian mentioned. So yesterday, yesterday I only know that Go also have web as support, where you just need to set the Go up, and then you can make use of that. And why why Rust? Okay, it is JavaScript JavaScript workshop, so I don't talk much. <laughs> so Rust is a system programming language. It's comparable with C and C plus plus in terms of low level, but uh, it focusing it focuses on the safety, concurrency, and speed. They always say that Rust is a they call it hack without fear because there's there's a uh, something called ownership and ownership model and uh, lifetime in Rust that make that doesn't let you have a uh, database and you don't need to have garbage collection because of that. Okay, so what makes us web assembly fast? So first, this is a blog post talks about web assembly and then they show what makes it fast. Basically, it's by Mozilla, and then uh, some of the pictures just now I took from from this. Okay, so next, this is a source map. This is a uh, one part last time. They make use of there's one project called Source Map in npm if I recall, if I recall correct, correctly. So it uses they use Source Map, but then they plan to transition it to Rust. For some reason, I think it's because of performance. Source map, I don't quite recall, don't quite know why it do uh, but we use it uh. So uh, here, here is the post, and then later on, someone posts in JavaScript. This is a performance guy. They talk about how how he speed up. He do benchmarks and benchmark a lot of benchmark and micro optimize the source map and later the speed became comparable with the Rust implementation where at first the Rust is like slower than faster than the JavaScript but then later right he made the he made the JavaScript even faster than the Rust by doing some optimization so they talk to talk about it very well in this blog post so I didn't make so I didn't put it, talk about it here. So later, and then when people found out found out about this, they just reimplement another guy. They saw the post, so he just re reused the techniques that he built on Rust. No, yeah, on the Rust again. So it's faster. Okay. So later, if you want to get started, you might want to look into the tutorial on Conway's Game of Life. By their group, and 
So the vision, this is the vision for the WebAssembly Rust. Why why Rust? Because uh, they have good support for know that this WebAssembly is one of their main target for 2018. One of the four main target for 2018 to excel in. So they want to have a good support for this. So what makes it a good choice rather than C and C++? Because uh, they don't have quite a huge community around that. So and then, should you use it? I think, uh, right now, no, probably. Unless you are building for low level games or you are just trying to play around with it. And if you try, right, you might, you might want to look into the Rust Wasm group that build good stuff around the tooling, the ecosystem that build around those. So you might want to look at that. Okay, the slide are done, maybe. Now I'll show the demo and the template, how it did look like. Is that? No, actually. Okay, so this is a template that the, build, the group built for the using WebAssembly to build for the Rust, using Rust to build for WebAssembly. So you can see here, I'll just go into it and how, how that works is, they will use a, So that here they put they put some scripts here, but then the readme is pretty pretty much useless uh, for this because it's quite new. They just showed this project like last week. And then this basically this build build uh build process is already quite, quite usual, like the normal conventional way. Let's say according to the book, they have a book about Rust Wasm. They have a book on that and they are still building it, it's not complete yet. Uh, but the process basically is like this. First, you compile, you compile the build the binary of the web assembly. So normally they will use a webpack. In the webpack, they will just import the module. But it's a bit buggy right now. So after you build the binary file for the after you build the binary file, it won't be reloaded by web assembly. So you need to close it and start it again. So basically, the build process looks like this. Yeah, maybe while I'm while he's building any questions. <laughs> yeah, I did try building just now like the Conway's Game of Life. They have a tutorial on that. So at the end product. But it's not here, uh, the game is not here. So uh, I built something, at first you have a simple, 
first step you try is that you build a simple file with uh, just plus like a function to add and minus just like that. But then if you want to play around with string, it will be more, it will be harder. For that, uh, you need to use make use of one library called wasm bind gen. So what it does is for the code, it will generate one for JavaScript and one for the Rust. So, uh, so that you can use functions on the JavaScript side. Basically, it's like a rule between JavaScript and Rust and the web assembly oh, for that. And uh, normally, the web assembly built, the file built is very big, but then this template, right, they already optimize it for you. They use, they use another uh, allocator, memory allocator, that makes the output binary file a lot, lot, a lot more smaller. But right now the output binary is a bit big, yeah. If you if you try building it, like so far, I think I last time I checked is around hundred. It's just more, just more file. Okay, okay. Yes, now they have. Uh, they came out with a new framework that uses uh, Wasm on the front end. It's like something. I think something like React. I just seen it like last week news from uh, Wasm because they, are, you know, they have a uh, Wasm. They have a uh, weekly news at the uh, thing here. But you say you can't manipulate DOM yet. Right now, can cannot manipulate DOM yet. But then you have a. Uh, So, so basically, basically they have a post like every week they will show some news about new projects. So basically, the one that I I showed right just last week news. There's a very new project on uh, having a client side framework using Wasm. But normally they say in they just have like a just like that for now. Still early really. Yeah still very early. But then for the string you can use it you, you just need to use the bind gen bind gen so then yeah still control oh, but then it compose for so long. No this one's slower Cargo is something like npm, but it's Rust default. npm is npm. It's not not default package manager, right? npm is another package manager, but then it's very huge. There's a very huge community behind it, and then there's also Yan built by Facebook. I don't know why they don't merge, but Cargo is the only package manager that you find in Rust. So they call it Chris. Uh. Yeah, there's also how they recommend you to install your. You can also use that to install your application. Fun fact: you can craft your own uh, web assembly yourself. The IR, uh, it, it's a media uh, web representation of a uh, web assembly. Is actually, X expression. <coughs> X expression is actually if you if you're not familiar with it, it is uh, the format used by Nix. Yeah. So that that's the assembly of web assembly. If you craft your own web assembly. Think, let me check. <laughs> I saw my lesson Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that called? Uh? Yeah. Some I asked. Oh, to do MVP. Yeah. Oh, I think they built one with uh, web assembly, so I just show you that. Awesome, you, you miss the test. 
Oh, I don't remember what is it, but it's something like the representation is something like uh, I cannot show. I cannot show right now, eh? Oh, still, still yeah, still compiling. So basically, what we expect to see is hello world in the console. No, they just print three, two, one. Yourself? No, but uh, Webpack Dev Server. Okay, okay. Webpack Dev, Dev Server does that. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, done. Oh, okay, just uh, 500 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You can see, uh. so basically it's like, I just print 0, 1, 2, and then on the debugger. Can we see the JavaScript code that came yeah. But you need to refresh, uh, it's something like, <laughs> something like this, uh. so it's very long. For the JavaScript, right, uh, you need to make it like, Okay, so no, not not this one. Yeah, like this. But basically, they'll do. But basically, what they'll do, they'll use web assembly dot instance something like this, and then they'll just instance the URL, and then dot then. This is for the streaming, which is supported only by Mozilla. Yeah, because Mozilla started web, web. so it's of course also built web, web assembly. And then it's only on it's only on uh, Firefox, but this is a lot faster. But they also have another interface to use web assembly, but it's not streaming. Uh. So after you call this, then you get the module <coughs> like the get the module name. And then you call the module name by function. This idea, though. Any questions? Okay, we have time for one question. <coughs> so it's more for, for now. I think it looks more like it's more for video games, high performance stuff. Yeah, but yes, I've seen. No, but the one thing about this is that. I've seen people build games that works on both the web and uh, on application because Rust can build for application, right? They can also make it build for web. On time platform. Yeah, something like that. There, there's something called and some graphics library that already can be used on the web, but it was on web, on the application. It was built for application, but then after like people keep porting their projects to web, so the the support web uh, wasm one by one they support wasm. So now quite a few projects they support. Okay, guys, give for either hand. Definitely. Yep. So I don't think most of us would have. Spend the time playing Wasm, thanks Ivan.
for showing us a preview. Um, so next up, we have Isa. Uh, he's a founder of at Deep Cloud. And we'll let him explain what it is. He's also uh, uh, formerly an ex-Facebook software engineer. So uh, he'll be talking about GraphQL, of course, <laughs> being a Facebook technology. Uh, and he'll show us uh, GraphQL and its benefits. I mean, I've got yeah, that will work. Also. Yeah. USB C. Is it not? Oh. I mean, I just mirrored it, so I don't see. There you go. Cool. Do I need to use this actually? No, it'll be better. Will be better? All right. Um, let me just make sure I get online. Oh, the nightlight mode, right. Uh, night shift. There you go. Better? Cool. So, all right, there we go. Um, we don't have a clicker, do we? No, it's fine. Um, yeah, so GraphQL. What is GraphQL? Well, GraphQL is a replacement for REST. I hate REST. I find REST just, um, the composition with REST is a pain in the ass. Um, I'm sure if any of you are web developers here, if you're a JavaScript browser developer, you realize how annoying it is. Um, a little bit about myself. So I work on a project called Deep Thought. Ask a lot of questions. I used to work at Facebook as well from 2010 to 2016. Um, I like to begin with this. Great questions are a much better indicator of future success than great answers. So please, uh, hit me up with any questions you have. Um, and also, disclaimer, there's a steep learning curve over here as well. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL replaces REST. Um, and it's actually not JavaScript specific. So much like in REST, where REST is the old way, you hit different endpoints. You know, you hit, a, you have a method. You hit get on, say, questions, or you hit questions dash one, or one dash one stroke answers, or businesses. Um, that is REST. And I've always hated composing a page from multiple REST endpoints because one, you have to make several. Uh, it gets repetitive. There's possibly millions of endpoints. Um, by default, REST will return its full output depending on your REST implementation, um, your API implementation. And if you want to debug this, you might need additional tools like, say, Charles or Get Postman or Pod of Cloud to help you monitor the HTTP request, make sure you get the thing back. Um, I mean, you could use your Chrome Inspector as well, but it gets gnarly. Um, and for me, composition sucks. Um, making multiple network requests is just always um, annoying. Um, so what is GraphQL? GraphQL is the new hotness. Um, Jonathan is right, Facebook did develop GraphQL. I used a bit of GraphQL in my work, but I didn't use much of it until I left, actually. Um, and it's actually, the QL part is like SQL. It's a query language. So what it's referring to is it's a query language for your API. At Facebook sees everything as a graph. Um, is anyone here familiar with graph theory? Nodes, edges, okay. not so important. Um, so one of the biggest, so first of all, the cons, the disclaimers. 
GraphQL has a huge steep learning curve. Um, it's not just simply hit and whack. Uh, it's not a simple curl request to test things out. There's a huge learning curve. There's also a fanning problem because your compositions, you can go multiple layers deep and you can hit a fanning problem really easily. Um, the one to many to many to many requests can lead to a large number of queries and requires caching. I haven't mastered the mutations in GraphQL and mutations are a little bit easier still to press. Um, so those are my, what I don't like about GraphQL at the moment. Um, and here's a little bit of more information, uh, the websites, the pros, and I'll go through a demo as well. So the biggest pros is for me, there's a single endpoint request, stroke GraphQL by default, where you can see um, GitHub has a GraphQL API, uh, and this is the query that you actually write. Um, GraphQL provides automatic documentation, which I'll provide, which I'll show you earlier. There's a visualizer, so it's a very nice, simple UI by default. Um, you can limit the fields returned, which is really great for front-end clients. You don't have to return the whole data set as a normal REST API is. All you want, for example, in this request, I think from this work, for this request, all I'm returning is the names of the first five repositories. So you, very, you can limit the data you return back. Um, and here's, some, here's the example query of what happened. So for example, uh, for example, if I use the GitHub GraphQL uh, and I pass this query in, the viewer, so you can see the nested curly braces, which tells me inside this query, put the viewer, give me the login name, and for the first five, rep five repositories, give me, for each node, give me the name. And this is the data that's returned. It's JSON data, but it's, to me, it's a sim much simpler composition than a multiple REST uh, endpoints. Um, so for example, this is just a simple comparison. Uh, for example, if I wanted to hit these endpoints for a question and the answers and for multiple questions to a particular topic, you know, like a many to many requests, I would have to hit three different requests, three different endpoints, um, which can be slow for a client application or the browser as well. But whereas in GraphQL, all I have to do is that simple composition, I can write it in a single query language, uh, in a single query, which to me, saves me a lot more time and is a lot more specific. I know in this particular request or this particular uh, page load, what is that single request that is going and how do I capture it? Um, so once again, GraphQL is just a query language and an API similar to REST. So you actually need uh, frameworks on the server side. What Facebook has provided actually is the first Node.js uh, implementation, which a lot of these other languages borrow from. I like using the Node.js version because I know that Facebook maintains it. Um, I originally started with a PHP version for my PHP app, but I scrapped that and moved to the JavaScript one because better support, better maintenance. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, my preference uh, for GraphQL and JavaScript. I'm the sole developer, easier to manage the front end, back end, Facebook wrote the implementation better support, um, and I tried the Symfony implementation. It was just extremely complicated. Oh, so here are some great examples of public APIs. There's actually the Star Wars API. This is what Facebook did provide as an example API to have people play around with, and I'll show you a bit about it. GitHub actually began with REST APIs v1, v2, v3, but for v4, when they made a new API, they decided to do a GraphQL implementation. Shopify has one as well, and Yelp has one. Um, slowly and slowly, I've been seeing more and more discussions about GraphQL on Hacker News, and there's more, more APIs that you can play with as well. Um, so here we go. Let's have a look at how to use GraphQL and Node.js. So quick, well, this is, the, this is the source code, but we'll look at the demo initially. All right, so by default, every, if I'm using the node app, uh, the node libraries, by default, every site gets a nice visual uh, query tool. So here is also the documentation on the right. So I can already, by default, the self-documentation system. I don't know what this API actually is. Um, I just pulled it up. So I can see that, okay, given the 
root node query, um, here are all the different uh, calls I can make on this. So for example, if I do, I'm gonna put this down. So for example, by default, if I call query, oh, and look, there's a type head. If I do all films, um, there are some arguments on the right. You can episode ID, um, and like this by default, if I hit play or submit, um, you can see this is the data it returns. And in one query, I get everything back. Quickly visualize what is the data I want. One. So GitHub, also exactly the same thing. Click here. Oh, I'm not signed in. Back UI. Um, this is the Star Wars API right here. Um, yeah, I, I, oh, what do I have next? Okay, so those are an example of how one can query the GraphQL. And actually, if you look at the network request itself, you can see it's all it's doing is just sending, uh, no, probably that's not a good one. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, no request is going for proxy. Let's see what this one does. Okay, so if you can see the, um, these origin request payload. The request payload is pretty much just sending the same query that is happening here. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Not as simple, and if I try, unfortunately, if I try copying this as a curl command, you can see there is a, uh, all right, you can see as a curl command, it's not really the most, oh, because it's all this other content, but as a curl command, REST is a little bit easier than writing these queries inside curl. Um, yeah, uh, where am I? Okay, cool. So now we're looking at how to use GraphQL in Node.js itself. So actually, once again, the Star Wars API is actually publicly available. Uh, source code is right here. We've been looking at a lot of source code. So very straightforward, you need your, this is your server, and inside your server you have your express server itself. You have your express server, and then what you do is we, have, we define the schema, the schema of the API and how it works. And inside the express server, we define the GraphQL endpoint. So for the Star Wars one, they define just the stroke, uh, the Graph H GraphQL HTTP and then the schema. And this is the Graph IQL is what enables the visual tool. So let's have a look at the schema itself. Dot, 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 schema. Oops. Ah, index.js, we'll go here. Oh, it's in flow. So these are all the import stuff. Um, oh, this is. Okay, so this is the main, this is the root node itself, the new graph, this is a bit blurry, isn't it? This is the root node itself, the GraphQL schema where you pass it the query and the root type. So every root, every object pretty much has, is a GraphQL object type. They called it here the root, I call mine the schema, um, it doesn't really matter. So over here, they, here are all the same fields that have been defined as you saw in the documentation. Uh, all, field, all films is a root connection from films, films, root field by ID, yada, yada, yada. Um, so this is how you define your schema from the top. And then from each one, it just breaks down into different GraphQL object types. These are, these are helper functions. Um, so root connection is, Root connection is this, which defines, okay, so this is a bit complicated, but it's just a helper function that defines more GraphQL object types. We have connection definitions, uh, swappy type to graph. So swappy is the Star Wars API type to GraphQL type. I go here, oops, ah, right, a relay node. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, there is another implementation of Graph. Oh, actually, not really an implementation. Um, because GraphQL has been becoming very popular as well, there's now GraphQL as a service. There are people such as Apollo, um, which provides these Graph GraphQL as a service, which you can use. And there's been a lot more documentation available. Um, so this is an example of how to use GraphQL in JavaScript. Um, RESQL, there's a lot more information here. Do, 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 do. You can go through this yourself. So there's back end, all the different backends and how to get started. Yeah. And that for me is really just the introductory of um, GraphQL. I prime, so for my own use case, I use it on my own project. Um, so for my project, much in the same way, I just now enable the GraphQL visual tool, um, iGraphQL. And for mine, I have, if I go to my representation, so let's say this is my front page, um, I have different keywords, packages, answers, questions, and I can just quickly go in, I can just do questions, uh, first 10, oops. So I, I use it for my own site and my own tools, and I find it just really simple to do the composition uh, play. Right. And that's how I use GraphQL and as a replacement for REST. What I like most is my, so my site is made in Node.js as the back end. For the front end, it is GraphQL is talking to React via a tool called Relay, such that if I do the inspect, there's actually, oh, let's just limit this. Let's do XHR, refresh. It's not reloaded to everything. Yeah. So as you can see, oh, it's done. So for all the data on my site, uh, well, all the data on the front page, I have a single, I have a single network request for it. I can see quickly what is the query being made. Um, and for me, that is a godsend in having multiple um, REST requests. Facebook also, I know Facebook uses GraphQL for its iOS clients and Android client as well, so that we can reduce the number of net requests to a single one. Um, yeah. And that's my little presentation on GraphQL right there. Any questions? Yes, Jonathan. Okay, sure. You're gonna, now you're gonna just see some ugly code. Um, let's just, so for myself, um, let me pull up my, so once again, GraphQL is just the, oh man, this just looks terrible on the screen. Um, so, GraphQL object type, um, for me, I have a question. And actually, this is not the right way to look at it. Um, where should I look? I should look at the, all right. Let me begin with my schema, that's a lot easier. Um, let's see if I can pull up the question. All right, and then let's pull up the, Oops, let's pull up this guy here so that, oh, wrong one. This guy here, so that we could have them side by side. Cool, okay, to hit the question. Um, oops. And if I hit play, so that's the question itself. So what's happening in this schema is, this is that, qu this question keyword right here matches this question keyword right here. And what I need is I need to build these resolvers. So these resolvers are actually how GraphQL resolves um, the arguments that you pass in. So this is argument one um, into a query. Over here, I have a helper function, so like one by args, where, hey, for the question, take these arguments and pass it in. Um, this is really, oh God, where is this one? I don't know where you are. Ah, so this one, as you can see, this is bad. It's very simple. Um, here's a next code where, where the arguments, I build the arguments, I limit it to one, I select it and I return it, and the GraphQL returns that. So that is how 
every every node you have has to have a resolver which resolves to the data. Um, this resolver, so over here is where I make the MySQL query. You can actually just return static content. You can return anything you want there, but that is where you return the query itself. And that is where you do the query. Any other questions? Writes are, uh, writes are nasty, um, in my opinion. So they're called, well, we call, GraphQL calls them mutations. Um, and by default, so this is the schema. In the schema, you have to define mutation. So I have the query, which is the main one. I have the mutation and the mutations. So the mutations are just nasty. Um, well, this is not a good example of it. Um, the mutations themselves are essentially just post, the mutations themselves are essentially just a single post request to, a, to the GraphQL endpoint. Um, I guess for me, mutations are nasty because of how do you interact it with a web browser front end. Um, with GraphQL, you have to specify, all right, does this happen at the end of the list of nodes or does this get injected to the beginning of the list of nodes? Does it, how does it get represented? It's, it's not convenient. Anyways, um, that's a sidetrack. So the mutations, the mutation is also a GraphQL object type. You define all the different mutations. So actually then over here in my docket, you can actually see the mutations over here and here are all the different mutations that happen. Um, I can see inside answer, cre let's go to answer create, oh, uh, answer, GraphQL mutations. All right, so then you have a, this is mutation, mutation with client, ah, mutation with client mutation ID, you specify the field name, the input fields are the different arguments, so if you look at a rest, it could be your query, um, what is the output fields return, you mutate it and get the payload, so this is where, on line 25, 26 is where you do the uh, database mutation itself. And over here, I passed it to a helper function um, because I might use the mutation in other places. It's, it's more tedious. In my opinion, the mutations are more tedious than it needs to be. Um, but what's nice is I get the typing by default. So I can do like, okay, I want to make sure it's not null. I want to make sure it's an ID, it's a string. Um, yeah. But it's, mutations are, for me, a very minor thing. I don't really like the graph field mutations. Yes? So the authorization, because it's a web application, um, you could use your cookies. Right, so that's where you're, you have to put that code inside the resolvers. So the resolvers need to, the resolvers need to know the uh, authorization. So should this, does this, does this uh, person have the correct accent of authentication in? Such that, hey, if this person, let's say this person is, uh, should not be viewing this, then you put it in the resolver or a n deeper layer that this person should not be receiving this data. And to be fair, actually at Facebook, that is what we did as well. We didn't, we, we had a, our own PHP implementation um, or hack lying implementation. And we, in the fetchers, the data fetchers, if you use an ORM, your ORM might have like, hey, can this person view this data or not, right? And then the access control is inside the ORM possibly. Oh, performance. Um, I haven't tested that actually. I would assume because of all the resolvers, it would be a bit slower as well uh, because of the fanning problem. Um, and what I mean by the fanning problem, I'll actually demonstrate it here. So let's go, I, let's say I go uh, keyword uh, slug, let's say faith. Um, and then let's say I want all the questions and inside each question, um, edges, node, 
and inside each question, give me, let's give me the question itself, and let's give me the keyword. Um, oh, sorry, this is not correct. This query is not correct. And for each question, give me the keyword for each of those questions. So now I just do first 10. Oh, I need to put an argument here also. Uh, first 10. Edges node uh, keyword, All right? So what I'm doing here is spanning from a keyword to multiple questions, and for each question, return me the first ten keywords. So you can see, well, these ones don't. Eh? Why is it? Oops. Well, that didn't work. Forward. Okay. Huh. All right. So this one does have multiple keywords, but you can see how easy it was for me to build up the composition. But there's definitely a fanning problem here. Uh, because I'm doing the keywords, I do one request, and then in that request, I do a search for many, for 10, and then in that 10, I do another search for 10. So by default, there is definitely an optimization problem there, um, which, honestly, my traffic is so low, I haven't solved it. I haven't tried to solve it. Um, but yes, that's definitely one of the optimization problems. Um, I would assume because of the resolvers, it's definitely slower than REST, but I think, for me, the benefits I get out of it for making a front-end application is tremendous. See, like, I can instantly, if I want to change how my front-end works with a single query, I don't have to make multiple network requests. Uh, yes? Dot .NET. I'm not so sure, actually. Yeah, I'm, I, don't, I don't use .NET, so I can't really say. Uh, we're gonna do. Uh, apparently, it does. So this is the list I took down. Uh. Elastic search directly. Yeah. Yep, I have that. I have a search um, query, let's say hello, and first 10. I've done that already. Uh, I can't remember what it is. Uh, let's say edges node. Uh, I can't remember how it goes. But pretty much I've done that. So if I go here, that's what I do here, uh, hello. And it hits a GraphQL and oil, well, I can just inspect this also. And see the network request. All right. But I've done the same. I put a elastic search behind GraphQL for me. Yeah. Viewer search results connection inside search. Edges, node, ah, yeah, and this is different answer search types. No questions? All right. Okay. Oh, that's connected to that. All right, a big thank you to all the speakers and um, Yep, see you again. Feel free to hang around for a few minutes, but let's get up by 9.45 or so. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, see you guys.